Being the mother of five children, my fifth one adopted later in his life and mine, the thought of losing any one of them is unimaginable. This episode is about the unimaginable, a mother, a family who lost a beautiful, funny, feisty, smart, caring, courageous seven-year-old to cancer. As many of you know, I have had my personal battle with cancer and currently my younger brother is facing his. Unless you have been through your own, it is hard to imagine the havoc that chemotherapy, radiation, and medications wreak on your body, not to mention your spirit when you are feeling sick and definitely not looking like anything familiar to your precancer self. As a grown-up, there are certain expectations of how I should be weathering my cancer journey. After all, I have lived a life, even if I am not ready to say goodbye. But a child, that is an entirely different story, one in which they are just beginning their life's journey, only to be shortchanged or at best sidetracked for a period of time where we bear witness to their suffering through various cancer treatments. It just doesn't get much worse. Welcome to Small and Gutsy, our podcast featuring nonprofits and social enterprises under $10 million. My name is Dr. Laura Whitkoff, and I'm excited and proud to be your host. We hope you'll love the stories as much as we do, and perhaps you will find needed services, a job, volunteer, invest in, or donate. Small and Gutsy is not just a podcast, but a 501c3 nonprofit. Our vision is to spotlight every smaller nonprofit and social enterprise to raise their visibility. So please help me with our vision and send me any organization you'd like featured at laura at smallandgutsy.org. Isabella Joanne Santos had a rare form of cancer, neuroblastoma, at age two. She endured chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, antibodies, numerous ups and downs, meaning multiple relapses for five years until she passed away at the age of seven. While many of us were reading our children bedtime stories, Isabella and her family were waging a war. What was so spectacular about Isabella was that she was truly a rare gift to her family and to those who were lucky enough to meet her. The word rare in this context means special, unusual as she was, and yet in the cancer world, rare means 700 children are affected each year. It means children usually under the age of five are diagnosed with a form of cancer. It means scary statistics about survival rates and relapses. In the case of the latter instance, rare is not one of the words you ever, ever want to hear. Established in 2007, the Isabella Santos Foundation, or ISF, is dedicated to eradicating pediatric cancer's devastating impact while honoring the legacy of Isabella Santos, her courageous fight against neuroblastoma. Collaborating with medical institutions, ISF drives innovative research to pioneer new treatments and enhance young cancer patients' lives. Over the course of 17 years, ISF has provided over $7 million in funding toward expanding the scope of research and treatment and supporting families dealing with cancer in a variety of ways. It was Isabella's dream to beat cancer, grow hair, and live her dreams. Although research and advanced treatments didn't come in time for her dreams to come true, Isabella's legacy will give other kids a fighting chance against rare childhood cancers. Like so many smaller, gutsy organizations, they iterated in a positive direction to meet the unmet needs of their constituencies, in this case, childhood cancer survivors. The foundation updated its mission as a result in 2020 to fulfill Isabella's wishes in three categories. BEAT, meaning invest in pediatric cancer research to fund a cure, grow, strengthening treatments for rare pediatric cancers, and live, supporting families impacted by cancer. In the new mission's inaugural year, ISF gave a record $1 million, significantly impacting each giving category, thanks to the extraordinary support of donors. This is what I love the best. I have to share this. These amazing kids even sport t-shirts that read, cancer messed with the wrong kid. I cannot think of a more fitting message articulating the courage 
of these young children facing a battle in which they were not and could not be prepared and facing the possibility of life not fully realized if not for new research medicines and treatment. They are one brave bunch who should be admired for their determination, their strength, I get choked up, and their character. Frankly, as a parent, I could not be prouder. So let's move to the interview of an extraordinary mother. I am so happy to introduce my guest today, Isabella Joanna Santos' mother. That's her claim to fame, not only, but in this context, an executive director and president of the foundation, Aaron Santos Primus. I hope I pronounced your last name correctly. Primus. Primus. Yes. Thank you. So let's get started. Erin, one of the things is I can only imagine over the last 17 years how many times you've told your story, especially being part of a foundation. And one of the things that has occurred to me is, um, as I mentioned, I had the chance to watch videos, just amazing videos on your website, and was truly, and I hate to use this word, but it really did. I was tickled by Isabella's character and her determination. You're smiling. Yeah. And that's really what came through. So I'd love to share what you'd like to share as we get to know the work that you have dedicated your life to doing on behalf of so many others who may have a chance because of Isabella and you frankly. Isabella was um, my first child. I was so excited to find out I was having a little girl. Um, And her life was pretty normal for a long period of time. Well, not very, very long, obviously. But and around the age of two, she started to complain of back pain and stomach pain. And we kept taking her to the doctor and the pediatrician. And they're like, oh, she's constipated. She has a bladder infection. And they kept sending us home. Um, You know, unfortunately, at the age of two, they can't really tell you what's going on. Um, And it's not like breast cancer where you feel a lump somewhere. So she was just living, you know, her normal life. So we finally, it just kept reoccurring. And and so we finally took her in for blood work, which was abnormal. And they said, we want you to get an MRI. Um, And we got an MRI. And then the next thing we knew, they took us in a tiny room and told us that she had a stage four tumor in her stomach. That she had stage four neuroblastoma. um, It had already traveled to her bone marrow as well. And the survivor rate was 40%. So, um, and zero if they relapse. Hmm. So we had never heard the word neuroblastoma before. I think everybody thinks of St. Jude's and they think of, you know, these little bald children that have leukemia, but I wasn't even aware. I'm trying to think of how old I was at that time. I guess I had just turned 30. I didn't even know that there were other types of cancer besides leukemia. Hmm. I never heard the word neuroblastoma. And of course now I'm engulfed in this, you know, horrible world of all these rare cancers that people really have never heard of. And it's just because of that. It's because they're so rare, 700 kids a year. A lot of times you may never know anyone in your life with neuroblastoma. So we started down the treatment path here in Charlotte and um, just weren't really excited about what our home institution was offering at the time. We started, you have to think back, this was back in 2007. So there was no (laughs) Instagram. Right. I'm to think if there was even Facebook, it was maybe MySpace at the time, but mm-hmm. we were just Googling really on the World Wide Web um, and finding survivor stories for neuroblastoma. And a lot of them were coming out of Sloan Kettering in Manhattan. So uh, we went up there for a second opinion and found out that they were doing things completely different. Uh, they were developing drugs there um, and making them th- them there in the hospital because the issue wow. we have with rare cancers is that there's not enough kids to make these drugs. So all of the drugs that our kids are getting are things that are passed down from adult cancer, stuff they've been using for 70 years, because you mm-hmm. need, a, you need a, a, a supply of children to be able to test these on that we just don't have available to us. Mm-hmm. So Sloan Kettering wow. did things differently where they were doing things taking certain things out of the treatment plan that they didn't feel like were effective, that were very harmful to children, which we were on board with. Um, They were developing a drug there that they were seeing a huge amount of success with called 3F8 at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, The problem was this 3F8 drug that we decided to put her on, they say was like watching your child be set on fire. So it attacks to the nerves of the child. Um, And it only lasts for 45 minutes, but it is a grueling, screaming, awful Mm -hmm. 45 minutes. Um, Luckily, they give the children enough drugs so to where they don't remember and they walk back in the next day and get it all over again. But just the horror that the parents have to go through to see their 
you know, two or three year old child receive this was just mm -hmm. something that's I'll, I'll never forget. Um, so we transferred her to her treatment up to Sloan Kettering, um, went through the process. And within nine months, she was clean. We released all these beautiful balloons. I had another baby. We thought we were behind this. Mm -hmm. And then within three months, she had relapsed um, and she relapsed in the brain. So we were thrown back into it. We actually moved our family to New York. We got an apartment. My mom moved in with us. We were living in like 800 square feet. It was just, it was insane. And we were going back and forth every day. She was getting treatments directly into her um, CNS system. It was just, it was really incredible to see what we were putting her through. Um, but also, and also what you all were going through. I right. mean, you were, you know, I mean, this was a family and you were just doing everything you possibly could. And the deep, I can't even imagine the feeling of you think you're behind it. And then all of a sudden it's back again. I, it's it, those kinds of things are just, you, you just can't think it, you think you're in a dream, in a nightmare, that it's not really real. It just kept pulling us back in. She kept beating it and then it would hit her again. And then she would beat it and then they would say, this is it. I wouldn't give her any more treatment, but they would see her twirling around in a princess dress. And they're like, we can't tell you to go home to hospice. Like she was just, yeah. just an incredible kid to watch that you would never know that she had cancer just draped through her entire body. I mean, they would give her chemos called the kitchen sink, which meant that they almost, they give her everything possible, almost kill her bring her back, she Ugh. beat it, be back at school. And then six months later, it's back again. I mean, it was just such an unbelievable journey of, um, you know, I journaled through the whole process and seeing the complete ups and downs of it, of like thinking she's going to pass away and now she's back at school and this might be her last birthday. And then the next year you have mm -hmm. a birthday party. It was the most unbelievable journey I've ever been on. To add to that, um, the, the thing about Isabella was that she made so many friends in the cancer space um, between, I mean, these doctors and nurses were her best friends because that's <laughs> all she was around. Um, or these other kids that she knew that were going through things that she would meet in the playrooms. Um, and she kept wanting to do something to help those kids. Like it yeah. wasn't ever registering to her that she was one of those kids. Mm -hmm. um, so she kind of started to get a little bit involved. She um, someone helped us organize a 5k here in Charlotte and she, I mean, I think we had 170 people there the first year, but I mean, she was going wow. to the door. She was speaking at convention centers on behalf of the Ronald McDonald house. She was on stage at the make a wish foundation. She was on TV at the blood center, trying to get people to come oh. into the blood. And we didn't think about it at the time because it's all she knew and it's all we knew. Mm -hmm. But looking back now, it's we can't find those kids that want to do that or parents mm -hmm. that want to be in the spotlight with their children being sick either. Um, but she was out there. Right. Um, and it sounds like she drove that process that you, you know, she drove the train, you were getting on it or not. She was doing it. And yeah. just the videos, I mean, you can just see her energy and her spirit and her, just her solid will. I mean, she's, you know, she yeah. was just a little rock star. And it was um, incredible. People yeah. would come up to her at events and want to take pictures and strangers and hugs. And she'd stand there like a like a celebrity and take mm -hmm. pictures with these two little strangers mm -hmm. um, and dance. And it was just it was incredible to, to watch her. Mm -hmm. And she knew every year when that race was coming that she was like, I am. And she would I feel like she would always relapse right before the race. But she would be like, I'm getting out of this hospital. But for that for that race, it was just crazy to watch her. She was beyond her years in yeah. so many ways. Don't you yeah. think like she just had a level of insight and knowledge that the rest of us are still trying to catch up. Yeah. Um, but she really laid the, the, she not to be a pun, she laid the foundation for her foundation in so many ways. Being her mom changed me into somebody that I never, ever thought that I would be. So I feel like not only did she set up the foundation, but she set up myself as well as her brother, her little sister. I mean, everybody, she changed everybody. Well, I guess just to wrap up her story, you know, relapsing five times, um, we just kept hearing new things were coming, new things were coming, but they just never come fast enough. 
she wouldn't qualify because she had had this amount of disease. And it just, mm -hmm. it got to the point at the end mm -hmm. that we just ran out of options. I feel really lucky that we got the five years that we did. And I almost think too, that that's what it was supposed to be because if she had passed away in one year, I'm not sure where any of this would be today. So I always say, I feel like she lived long enough to make sure that this was gonna continue. So the years that she was alive, um, I journaled my, um, my journey with her. And I think that's kind of helped how things kind of started to get going. Cause as I said, we didn't have social media. So people were reading these journal entries and following along um, to where we had over 700,000 people at the end that were following wow. this journey. So, um, wow, that's fantastic. That's so, unbelievable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the first year, you know, we had 150 people mm -hmm. out there and raised $7,000. And then um, the last year she was there, I think that we raised, you know, over a over hundred thousand. You know, all of that money was going to neuroblastoma research. We were sending it to Sloan Kettering where she was being treated because that's what you do. You, you're greasing the wheels to make something happen, but that isn't really the case. And then after she mm -hmm. passed away, um, mm -hmm. I decided to go mm -hmm. back to what I did before, which I was in computers and tried to go back to work and tried to keep the foundation kind of going on the side, but it was growing and growing and growing. So after a year, I decided to quit my job and do this full time. And then it just kind of started to take off where we were raising mm -hmm. 200, 300, 500, 700, and it just kept going. And I think the the reason it did so well was because mm -hmm. I was grieving through this whole thing. I mean, we were doing events, you know, we did a race three months after her funeral, which I just can't even believe that I stood out there uh. and, you know, hugged everybody. And, you know, all these people felt like they knew me and they were strangers to me, and people dropping stuff off on our front doorstep. And it was just, mm. I used this foundation to help me continue to talk about her. Um, and it took me a number of years to get right. myself together, mm -hmm. to be honest. Yeah. Well, I, I can't, it had to. First of all, the whole trauma of living through all of the illness and watching your child go through that is one aspect and your family and you have other children. And then on top of that, facing the, again, sort of the unimaginable as her passing. And I, you know, in part, I wondered why I didn't sort of initially let you finish that story. And I think because in looking at your website and watching the videos, there's a piece of me and forgive me for this, that feels like she's with us. There's just, uh, you're, so it yeah. just feels like it's not just a legacy. There's some spiritual thing that is out there. And I don't mean to make light of that or anything kind of weird. It's just a feeling I get because she w had such a strong presence. Yeah. So um, thank you. That was beautiful, actually. Um, share more about the foundation, share about Isabella's three wishes. They were so distinct and so clearly articulated. And I know in 2020, you revamped a bit of your mission, but I'd love to, I love that sort of three categorical components that were really meant something to her and now means so much to others. Yeah. So the reason it came about was because you know, not only was she in a princess dress with a bald head, but she would wear T-shirts that said, I heart my oncologist or <laughs> someone got her a shirt that said, be cancer, go here, live my dreams with check marks. Or she just, okay. she, you know, we were like, they know, everyone knows that you have cancer. You don't need to wear these shirts. <laughs> Um, but she just wore it, you know, and she'd wear it with like a zebra dress, you know, skirt. Yeah. And it was just, it was so fitting for her that it was just kind of something that we just kind of started to to go with. I think the one thing with the foundation is that, you know, I struggle with the word beat cancer because I feel like I don't, I can't put that pressure on ISF to come up with the new drug that's going to cure neuroblastoma, right? Like that's going right. to be millions and billions of dollars. And I may not even see that in my lifetime, but I think that there's a way that we could still beat cancer in another way bringing doctors here to Charlotte that mm -hmm. the people may not have access to that. And, and that doctor may help them beat cancer. It may not be a new drug, but it may be a person that helps them beat cancer or, mm -hmm. you know, a treatment that's out there that we can test to see, does that really work? And if it doesn't, then let's stop doing it because that makes kids lose their hearing. And that's mm -hmm. kind of grow hair of kind of like, how can we make things better? 
And then the Live My Dreams, I just think that so many people were so great to our family during mm -hmm. the process of it. Of course, there's so many organizations out there that do great things with food and gas cards. And we try not to get into that space as much because there's a lot of places that do that really well. But there were a lot of people that gave her days where she completely forgot that she had cancer. Ah, uh, it's beautiful. Um, you know, the, mm -hmm. we our local um, Carolina Panthers, the Top Cats are our cheerleaders and they made her a Top Cat for a day. And uh. I mean, they just showered her with everything you could possibly imagine. And that didn't really cost them anything, but I'll tell you what, for her, it was one of the best days of her life. So mm -hmm. we try to think of ways that we can do things for kids that make them forget about the fact that they have cancer for a minute and also their siblings. You know, mm -hmm. my children were taken under. We always said, don't you dare drop off a care package for Isabella and not have something for Grant there because we cannot have this his entire life to think that he is less than. So right. we definitely That's try to take point. the entire family to do things um, for the siblings whether that be like take them to like have them have an art class for a day. You know, a lot of these mm -hmm. kids, they lose out on playing soccer and ballet right. and all this stuff. So if they can't be around other people, then we will close down an entire art studio and let them come in there and paint and draw and have a day and bring their siblings in. And it's just it's just about forgetting cancer for a minute, um, yeah. even if we can do it for just a day. That beat, grow, live is still something that we stick with because it's that's still her. So no matter what mm -hmm. we look like in 10 years, there will still mm -hmm. be an accident of beat, cancer, grow, hair, live my dreams. When you be, when you transitioned to take over and thought, I'm going to quit my job, I'm going to do this full time, you, you had to have made a decision that you will be immersed in this and continue to be. Can you share a little bit about... Um, what that might have been like for you, because then you are living this experience every day. And I don't know what that's like. Yeah, it's funny. I think about that a lot now because I think about, you know, I'm 47 years old. How long do I want to do this? Um, mm -hmm. And when people call me and say, you know, my child has this, I'm thinking about starting a foundation. I specifically say to them, please research and see if somebody is out there doing what it is mm -hmm. that you want to do and be a part of that. Because for the rest of my life, I am going to be known as this. And of course, if I would go back over again, of course, I would still do it. But, mm -hmm. you know, to have to, you know, talk to have people call me that their kids are in hospice and, and having to deal with that or sitting and having coffee across from someone whose kid is just diagnosed and they're crying and I have to relive it or going to children's funerals. But the reward of it is so amazing that, you know, a board member I finally had to figure out how to not have my grief be the thing that people need to see mm. to donate. And a board mm -hmm. member once told me, "You're, we are no longer going to profit from your grief. So I've started to be a little bit more um, shy away from kind of like just, you know, ripping the Band-Aid and, and mm -hmm. bawling my eyes out and talking about how much I miss her and what life is like without her because I just, I can't do that anymore. So I've kind of had to make it my own private um, story mm -hmm. now. And mm -hmm. the great thing is, is that we have such a great name here in Charlotte that we've had so many wonderful families that have agreed to like speak on behalf of ISF or their their children will come up and, and speak at events. And I think that that's how, where we had to move this to mm -hmm. or else I could never move on with my life. And that's what I, I go through phases where I'm kind of like, let's stop making this about Isabella because I have to think too, that like she'd be 19 or 20. And I would think that she'd be like, mom, take my picture <laughs> down. Like, I don't yeah. even like that picture. So I'm also <laughs> becoming like really weird about what pictures they're selecting because in my mm -hmm. mind, I'm like, she'd be 19 and she would hate that picture. So take that mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. um, so you're being a good mom. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the hope I'm trying to protect her now, but, yeah, um, yeah. but the hope is that People will see us um, and our success and think, because we made a lot of mistakes in the beginning of like where to give money or how to fundraise or different things like that, that my hope is that other families see what we're doing and think, you know what, they've got it figured out now. So mm -hmm. I'm going to raise money and donate it to them because they have figured out the best use of that fun of those funds. Because I think a lot of times hospital systems are like, yes, give us money, give us money, right. give us money. Um, and, and a lot of times it maybe goes into an unrestricted general bucket where they can use it on whatever they want. Whereas I'm like, no, 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 don't do that. Give it to us because we have specific, you know, more contracts in place to where this has to go towards osteosarcoma research. And I want to know what it's going towards or if I want, and 
you know, they have to report back to us. And a lot of those things you have to put in place to make sure that the funds are utilized in the way that you want them to. Right. So the hope is point. that not only do our donors feel good when they donate to us because I'm a stickler about where the money goes, but the other families that are, you know, raising money that might have a rare pediatric cancer know that we have a track record of of doing the right things with the money. It shows clearly respons- your responsibility, your integrity. The other thought I had, because I'm a consultant as my other a piece of my other part of my life, I wonder if it would be interesting for you. And I don't know if you've thought of this. I didn't see it on the website, but I didn't. I don't know if any of these families choose to are able to raise a significant amount of money that can fit into what one of your buckets, and that they could name a particular piece of that bucket. You know, some after their child. And the reason I'm that. you do yeah. that's great. I'm so happy you do that. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. We've got mm-hmm. a we've got an amazing family um, that had a little girl named Madison who actually passed away at the age of seven as well mm-hmm. from osteosarcoma. And this family, they have an organization called Live Like Madison, and they give us hundreds, you know, hundred, two hundred thousand dollars a year, and we wow. guide it towards osteosarcoma research Love in it. her name, and then name whatever it is that we're going to do on behalf of their daughter. So that's great. I, mean, I know how hard it is to raise money, and they want that legacy. So please take take the legacy of it. Um, let us help you guide where it should go. But I mean, splash whatever you want all over it because your daughter is worth it just as much as mine. For a long time, we just raised money for neuroblastoma research. But then when you start meeting these families that have these other rare cancers, no no cancer is worse than another when you're in the rare space. So that's why we right. decided to pick up all other rare cancers. And a lot of times, some of these trials, they can do them for osteosarcoma and neuroblastoma. So I'm like, let's mm. start banding together. Oh, I like of that. Working down these individual silos. And, and I know it's hard for parents, especially if you lose a child to a certain cancer, mm-hmm. to think about funding a cancer that wasn't what they passed away from. That's an excellent point, because medically speaking, there are ways in which some of the treatments are going to cross over. And so therefore, mm-hmm. everybody benefits and so you don't think about that when you're in the midst of it, but it's a great point that you make. Um, are there any other aspects of the foundation that you want to share in terms of programmatically? Yes, yes, definitely. So I think this year is a big year for us. So, you know, the evolution of ISF of starting from sending money to Sloan Kettering with neuroblastoma and then focusing here in our hometown of Charlotte for neuroblastoma, and then opening it up here in Charlotte for other rare cancers. So now we've built such an amazing institution here in Charlotte for anyone that has rare cancers. We've got kids coming from 24 different countries now to Charlotte to get treatment. So now, um, you know, when you go over there, you see kids that are from India, Michigan, um, Germany, all over the place, which is amazing that we've been able to build that. The problem Mm -hmm. with rare cancers um, and rare cancer families is that if you're in Charleston and you know that you could get a better treatment in Charlotte, sometimes it's still hard to do that trek to Charlotte. And then they'll want to stay because of their family, their school, their church. So this year we've decided to um, start funding all of the cancer institutions for children in North and South Carolina. Wow. So starting May 1st, we're going to be sending out RFPs to all 10 hospital systems and say, what is it that you need to make serving children with rare cancer better at your institution and let ISF help that. So our donors here in Charlotte are so great that they don't, of course, they want some of the money to stay here and and help local children. But the donors that support ISF, they don't care if they're helping a kid in Charleston, um, Raleigh, Asheville, Columbia, they don't care. So I think for us, to, we're starting to spread our wings and now saying, okay, let's take on 10 institutions and see if we can take them from, you know, a three to a six and then a mm-hmm. six to a seven and really mm-hmm. kind of grow the care in the Carolinas so that everybody has a chance of survival here and doesn't have to wow. leave their home hospital to go get something to, to survive. And then hopefully, you know, in three to five years, if I'm still doing this, of course, um, <laughs> you know, to continue to to expand past that. But mm-hmm. for me, I don't care where the best neuroblastoma idea is for osteosarcoma. It's in Columbus, Ohio. I'm like, let's do it. And I think that's what we need to start doing. I feel good that we have our local hospital to be where it is. But mm-hmm. now there's only so much money you can give one institution. You have to kind of start thinking about like somebody that's two hours from here that won't drive here. How can we help? help that kid. 
Yeah, we're really excited about it. It's called the TORCH Initiative, which stands for Transformational Outcomes for Rare Cancer Heroes. So our hope is to go into these communities and say, how can we transform the outcome for your kids? And then that's what we'll help you do. So toward the end of the podcast, we always have a round of quick and gutsy questions. They're fun. You don't, yeah. Oh no, the panic sets in. I can see it. No, they're fun. You can pass. You don't have to give a response, but they're really, it, they're organic. And we always get pearls that, that come out during this time. So are you ready for the quick and gutsies? Go for it. Go for it. Okay. What is at the top of your wish list for the Isabella Santos Foundation? However, the answer can't be money or funding. You know what? National exposure. Love it. Mm -hmm. Finding the spotlight on what we're doing is so valuable Mm -hmm. in every sense. Yeah, Yeah. it it really is. It's a great Mm -hmm. answer. Great answer. If you were to think of a song that describes ISF, what would it be? Well, they always come back. It's always videos of her dancing. So, you know, she loved single ladies and oh. Miley Cyrus. And um, what is the one? I mean, when people hear those songs, they always say, oh, I heard this song today. It made me think of Isabella. Isabella. Because she, she was just just a crazy kid when it came to dancing. So people mm-hmm. always think of songs and, and say, I heard this and made me think of her. I love that. There's eight songs probably, but all of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's that female empowerment. She, Mm -hmm. you know, that was, that defines her in a lot of ways, right? I love that in so many ways. It's great. Um, What makes the Isabella Santos Foundation gutsy? Because you're definitely gutsy. I think the realness of it. I think that um, I always tell everyone at my team, think of how you would ask people to give money to cancer and then let's do that differently. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's be, let's be more real and not as PC as, as mm-hmm. we need to be. This, this mm-hmm. isn't a PC topic. Yeah. And you know, when you say that, what it reminds me of is your journey was incredibly raw. You didn't know from moment to moment you were, it hadn't heard of it. You were, it had to go th- with experimentation. You had to go with what was available. So every turn was what had its raw moments. And I think that that's been incorporated in who you are as an organization, which is really amazing, but it certainly makes you gutsy. Um, and it made Isabella was incredibly gutsy. You know, she's a, incredible spokesperson. What is something that outsiders or maybe even a few insiders don't know about the Isabella Santos Foundation? I think maybe how, may, and maybe I'll just answer this for myself, of how emotional it still is for me. Mm-hmm. And like how, um, you know, like I just finally started going to therapy um, mm-hmm. because I just felt like this how, how successful an event is, or if we're able to get people to show up to things or how people donate or how people respond, it wrecks me all the time. And I wish that it didn't, I wish that I could treat this as just a business, but I take everything so unbelievably personal and I wish I, I, and I wish people could knew that when they donate something out, you know, that just blows me away. I mean, I come home and I'm just like in tears about it. Or when people no show to something, I'm in tears about it because it all means so much to me. And I, I hate that sometimes, but I wish people knew that like every single way that they supported or not supported affects. affects me. You know, I, I think I wonder if this is a part of what goes on for you, because I think it would for me is um, none of that brings her back. And so it's just a constant reminder of Mm. of the hole in your heart that's still there. Mm. And I don't know that that ever mends. And the only fulfillment is your feelings and the fact that what created this foundation was your rawness and your feelings and your honesty so I do want you to get help for that because obviously it drives you crazy. Yeah. And at the same yeah. time, and I could totally relate to it, at the same time, that's a beautiful part of who you are. I just mm-hmm. I just need to say that. It's mm-hmm. it you know, it's the humanness in you that other people connect to. So it's just 
Yeah, it's the beautiful part of who you are. So I want you to hold on to that and still not fall apart when there's (laughs) something good or something bad. If you can do both, I'll I'll really be happy. Um, uh, If you could get one celebrity or influencer to talk about Isabella Santos Foundation, who might that be? Uh, Mackenzie Scott, just because, not because, well, of course I would love if she gave us millions of dollars, but I think that... I think what's so amazing about her is that she is change. She is transforming. I mean, you know, you think of like the money that people are paying to go to space and I'm like, do you have any idea what that type of money would do in a space like mine? And I have just watched her change the landscape of every, I mean, everything. And that was one person. And that's where I love, not that Isabella was like her, but I just think that like, what an incredible gift to leave Mm -hmm. the world in a better place than you found it. And every time I see that she does something, that's somebody that, um, you know, maybe I'm sure she wouldn't speak on behalf of ISF, but having her know what we're doing Mm -hmm. and how she is like, what an amazing thing Mm -hmm. that she is doing. um, And and I totally agree. And without fanfare. Yes. Without fanfare, right? She writes a check. She says, I believe in you. This is what yeah. I, you know, and you, you and Charlotte and gives a ton of money to the local Y and you don't even see her. And you know? what I particularly like about her is she believes that the people who are doing the work know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. She doesn't dictate. And I really appreciate that. She just yeah. funds and supports and believes in them. And that's, you know, it's quite remarkable. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I love that. That's great. Any other last minute thoughts or comments that you want to make? And also, how do people find you? What's the best way to reach yeah, you? So they can go to IsabellaSantosFoundation.org um, or .com. Follow us on Instagram, um, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, all those places. But um, but I also encourage people to just reach out to me. Like I'm so accessible. You can reach me at Erin at IsabellaSantosFoundation.org. Um, I'll have coffee with anyone. I'll have a phone call with anyone. Um, I love having people say, I heard you on this thing and I just, just wanted to sit and have lunch with you. I'm like, let's do it. So I'm open to, to meeting anybody that if if they feel like that this, what we're doing, it speaks to them. Yeah, that's great. I'm going to encourage that on the podcast as well. Like whoever is local or even not, you can zoom just like we're doing and to reach out and to learn more about, um, the foundation and what you're trying to do and all of the impact Mm -hmm. that you have made with these families and these kids and in the research arena, because you've done all of that and you've done it initially with a single run fundraising run early on. Isabella was involved Yep, every year. And she's still involved in her own way. So, and so it's your whole family, it sounds like, which is really remarkable yeah, and really beautiful. I, I just want to take a moment and thank you. I was, uh, it was hard for me to get through my opening, but I watched a lot of the videos and read the materials and I was so deeply moved by what came through is really Isabella's charm and wittiness and character and determination, all the things that I said in the beginning. And I put myself in your shoes as much as I could. And I thought, I this is unimaginable to me, all of the stuff that you went through uh, in order to yeah. really try to figure out how can you help your child? And all of us would do that. And so I just want to thank you for sharing, for being raw. And I love that because I am too. And we're human. And so my wish is that everyone who Mm -hmm. listens to this reaches out to you and uh, that you, I hope you realize um, how proud every mother should be Mm -hmm. of what you have created. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you for having me on and also for what you do. Giving a platform to nonprofits um, is, you know. That's, it's unbelievable that you that you do that. So um, so thank you so much for that. It's, it's my pleasure. It's really a gift to me. You've your the conversation today is truly a gift to me to know that there are people out there who have done this year after year after year and are dedicated and believe in what you're doing and have to relive this, which we talked about, which is not easy. I just I I just think it's incredible. And so thank you. Thank you. Please go to smallandgutsy.org to check out all of our episodes. 
And if you were so inclined, please purchase some small and gutsy merchandise, consider sponsoring an episode or making a donation. Both are tax deductible to help keep us going and spotlighting these great organizations. The opinions and viewpoints expressed by our guests are independent and do not reflect the position or views of Small and Gutsy. Of course, we can't take responsibility outside of our own vetting of the organizations we interview. So before you sign on to support or work for them, we encourage you to do your own due diligence and research them as well. I want to thank my partners in this endeavor, the Intrinsic Group, my incredible board of directors, Tracy Brown, John Gatto, Lucy Mello, Serena Rajabian, and Melissa Greitz, who believed in me in this project enough so to sign on to support this effort and all the folks, friends, and family who have guided and inspired me. And thank you for listening. Together, we are spreading social impact and you can help us. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends. From small and gutsy to big with impact, I'm Laura Whitkoff and thanks for listening.